Uh, sorry, thank you very much. Very good. So we are now recording this meeting and that a link will be sent to you. So I'm turning back over to Fred. Uh, no, to, uh, Pat uh, is okay. our chair for this evening. Pat. Afternoon. <laughs> good evening, everyone. Yeah. Or good afternoon. Yeah. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, um, hope everyone had uh, a pleasant summer. It was definitely different, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, and again, uh, thank you, Devetta, for the welcoming, in. And thank you, Fred, for coordinating and uh, running all the computers and so forth for this. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to have Dean Saputa as the first speaker. Is he ready and, and able to perform? Okay, good. Uh, great. Dean has served as the HVAC community for more than three decades, uh, helping to educate and train facility managers, specifying engineers and industry professionals with an emphasis on uh, air and surface treatment and cleaning technologies. He's an active member on several ASHRAE technical committees. He's a contributing author of both 2019 ASHRAE application handback, uh, handbook, 2020 ASHRAE HVAC Systems and Equipment Handbook, and he's currently serving as a member of the ASHRAE uh, Epidemic Task Force Committee on Filtration, Air, and Surface Disinfection. So uh, turn it over to you, Dean. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Let me see if I can go ahead and get my screen up here. Give me one moment to <coughs> share the screen. Um, did you turn me over as a presenter? Because I'm not able to share the screen right now. Here we go. Got it. Jump that up. I was asked to go ahead and put in about uh, uh, about five, uh, 10 slides, maybe 15 minutes of quickly about really ultraviolet lights and the mitigating disease transmission with germicidal UVC. So um, we, I'm also doing the AEE um, New England chapter tomorrow. I, I'm the, the, the lead speaker there tomorrow. And then um, I have uh, National Academies of of uh, science tomorrow, which that's a three hour one. So you're gonna see the abbreviated version of this and I certainly hope you have some questions on it. So what we're talking about is the application of ultraviolet lights in an inside air handling units or going to be in upper room units. The, um, so what you're seeing here is you're seeing actually air disinfection would be one, one means of ultraviolet lights. The, the second one would be ultraviolet upper room disinfection. May not be that familiar with it or maybe becoming more familiar with it. And then something we've done before, I guess it's on a timer. So, so the other one is air, uh, HVAC coil and surface clean. So I'm gonna quickly cover three of them. Obviously the big thing today is about what, how UV can be used for air disinfection. So there's a lot of parameters that go into something when we're doing air disinfection. We need to know a lot more information than we do for just a coil or radiation. Um, we've been using UV for air disinfection for uh, since the early 90s, kind of fell out of favor because there wasn't that many folks using it. It was mainly for coil irradiation, but certainly something we can do. Uh, we just need to know, really, here's your mathematical formula. We need to know what's called a rate constant of the product that we're trying to inactivate. This particular thing that we're looking at is a coronavirus. Um, so we know what the, the rate constant or what's called a K value of what it takes for us to be able to uh, inactivate that product. So being able to take your height, your width, your depth, your airflow, your removal rate, we can tell you exactly how, again, I apologize, the timer's on, um, how, much of, how much removal rate you can get with the number of lamps you can put either in a duct system or in an HVAC system. Um, so they can be anywhere from 90%. You kind of see here's a D90 dose down here. We, that's part of how we register it. D90, there's a D95 and there's a D99. So whatever removal rate you're looking for. Um, so really, again, just a quicker rate, we're gonna take a look at what the rate constant is of a specific product. That's that coronavirus that we saw there. We need to know the airflow, how fast the air is going. Uh, air temperature, relative humidity, exposure time, again, the dimensions of that duct. Um, is there any duct reflectivity that we can gain with having that in there? Uh, sometimes aluminum can help us achieve a higher dose of UV. It's all about a, a matter of how long do we have to see that product. Whenever you're doing modeling or applying UV lights, we wanna do it at the end of the life of the lamp, not at the beginning of the lamp's life. So when we're disinfecting, disinfecting air streams, we're looking at something what we call on the fly. 
Uh, we definitely want the lamp to provide us a 360 degree distribution of energy in this cavity. What you're seeing here is a downstream side of a cooling coil above a drain pan. But we have in this particular place, this is an 80 inch high by 96 inch wide by 24 inch depth path. We want that lamp to give us a 360 degree distribution of energy. It allows us to see that product for a longer period of time. We need about a, a quarter of a second to see it, uh, to be able to inactivate up into the 99% area. Um, ASHRAE has position documents currently on the application of, of See if I can just pause that, it just keeps moving forward. Uh, ASHRAE's position document on airborne infectious diseases and then ASHRAE's position document on infection, infectious aerosols. The infectious aerosols has just um, taken over for the infectious diseases. Same information that's in there. Um, basically what they're saying is if you're looking at uh, certain facilities like healthcare, correctional, education, hotel, retail, um, these are the strategies, engineering controlling strategies that, that we recommend through ASHRAE. Can you dilute? Can you change your temperature and humidity? Um, can you add personalized ventilation? We're doing that now. Uh, local exhaust, can you increase filters? Can you move to a, a MERV 13 or even a HEPA filter? Can your, can your systems handle that static electricity? Um, static, static pressure, pardon, pardon me. Local air filtration, those are the roll in the room units. Can you add upper air UV lights in? These are the things that I showed a little earlier that are mounted on a wall in a specific room. We'll see those in more congregate areas where you may see uh, classrooms. We're seeing quite a bit of classrooms right now that are using upper air UV. Quite a bit of um, airports are putting them in the TSA area. So big, big areas for uh, upper room UV. Duct and air handling, kind of just what we were talking about. Can we size and put systems in for duct and air handling? In the infectious um, disease position document, again, it talks about UVGI has the ability to damage uh, the structures of nucleic acids and proteins. The CDC has approved UVGI along with filters. Um, and then really the thing that is in that position document is be, be cautious of many new technologies that aren't very well validated. We've done a nice job on the ASHRAE uh, epidemic task force to go through. We have a filtration and disinfection area where you can go through and look at the different techno technologies and um, those should be some things that you, you should be able to get to. I know I only had about 10 minutes to do this so I hope I was able to give you a little bit of background. I can open up questions or we can do it later on however you choose to do it. Pat, you there? Uh why don't you go ahead and I think take questions now, uh, sure. Dean? Sure, let me get to the screen here to make sure that I've got that up and see if anybody's asking questions. And let me just get to my, there we go. So anything in the chat? Let me stop my screen sharing here. All right. I don't see any questions in the chat. Do we need to unmute anybody for questions or? Yeah, we're back. So uh, Don actually came up with a question. Uh, what, what design considerations should be taken regarding other components and materials in Airstream? So in ASHRAE, we did two studies of, of uh, products that can be degraded by UV. And so some of the concerns that we have in those studies are filters, obviously that's the number one thing that we, if we're gonna have UV lights shining on a filter, we need to make sure that filter is UV resistant, cannot degrade, maybe Don will touch on that a little bit. Um, other materials that you wanna make sure of is going to be wiring. You wanna cover wiring uh, either through conduit or even with aluminum tape will reflect the UV energy. And the third thing that we found the biggest uh, problem with inside, mainly, mainly we're gonna be downstream side of a coil. So we're really not gonna see filters like pre filters for example, but we find uh, Armaflex black spongy wrap kind of thing. Need to unmute Dean. Are there any measures in place for multifamily response to COVID? I, I don't, I think that we don't have in our epidemic task force. I think we cover buildings, schools, but I don't think that in our epidemic task force, we cover that at this point. Good question. 
Uh, how does COVID application compare to what's been used for cool clean and how much greater intensity? So yeah, there's a lot more intensity to be able to be that you need to put in from a coil irradiation. We in ASHRAE say you only need about seven watts per square foot to, to treat a coil. When you start to get up large with higher doses, we have to get for coronavirus around 1500 microwatts, which puts us in about a 20 to maybe 30 watts per square foot. So it can be about four times as much to get a decent 95 to 99% in activation on a first pass. But we are seeing some folks being able to put in MERV 13 filters, um, be able to capture some and may not go to that 99% first pass, maybe going to a 95 or a 90 first pass and doing a combination of filters and UV together. So that's a good question. Uh, where can I find products approved for Airstream AHUs and how to ensure safety and maintenance staff? That's a great question. One of the things that we have, have a concern about is the products that should be placed in an HVAC system should be approved by uh, UL under a category called APQK, which is air duct accessories. So make sure that those products are certified by ABQK. Um, and definitely what you want to look at first, make sure there's a, and all UV products have to be registered with the EPA. So it has to have a, a label on the product that says EPA registration number. It's actually, believe it or not, we're under the pesticide side of it because we are killing a microbe. So that's a pesticide. So we have to file for, for products to be EPA approved for pesticide. Uh, polymers generally degrade under UV light and can lose their tensile strength. I would how long can filters last under UV light? I'm going to really refer that back to maybe the filter folks uh, that know that a little bit better. The, te the ones that we tested in internally were with ASHRAE were fiberglass, and we didn't do, we did a synthetic filter. The synthetic filters didn't last very long. So I'll, again, I'll let the, the filter folks answer that if you don't mind. Uh, how long of an exposure at 20 to 30 uh, watts per square foot is required for airborne transmitted pathogens for a 95% first pass? Really, what, what's the most important thing for us in an HVAC system is the length of exposure. So you really want to look for a couple things when you're applying that. The 20 to 30 watts is a general rule of thumb. Sometimes in packaged rooftop units that are sitting on top of a roof, you don't have much room in there at all. So you really are not going to be able to achieve a really high rate of disinfection. When you're down into the units like I was showing in the presentation, you have the ability, maybe there's 24 inches or 30 inches inline depth. That's very achievable to be able to, to put lamps in there in the maybe 15 to 20 watts. So if you have longer inline depth and slower air, the better it is for the UV. So that was a great question. I don't want to take too much of the other presenters time, Pat. So please certainly. Stop. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, let's let's move on. Yes, um, <clears throat> okay, so Don Largent is our next speaker. Um, <clears throat> he's a director of high purity product management at AAF Flanders, uh, and he's involved in global high purity filtrations, containment, and chem bioradiology nuclear protection industries since 2006. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Pennsylvania State University and an MBA from Loyola University. He participates in standards development and filtration industry organization and committees. And he's involved with ASHRAE, the Institute of Environmental Sciences and Technology, Controlled Environmental Testing Association, and the U.S. Technical Advisory Group to the ISO Technical Committee. Uh, without any further ado, Don Largent. Thank you, Pat. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, thank you, National Air Filter, um, my, my local rep, for inviting me to participate in this forum. Um, appreciate it. Uh, bear with me while I share my screen. I have two screens, so I'm going to see how this works out for me. I'm not used to the uh, to this forum. I use uh, Microsoft Teams primarily, so yeah, if you can bear with me for one second. <clears throat> so hopefully I can figure this out without further ado. All right, can you see my screen in presentation mode? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right, so <clears throat> we're going to uh, just uh, follow up with uh, on, on what Dean was speaking about with the ASHRAE recommendations and such, particularly in light of uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, which we've all become probably um, uh, moderate experts over the last uh, six to seven months. Uh, but the agenda I'm going to run through uh, quickly um, is the background on SARS-CoV-2, what ASHRAE's uh, position statement has been, 
Um, and then some of the mitigation strategies, uh, some applications and equipment and selection tools. So a quick background, um, basically COVID-19, which is what everyone's talking about in the news, is the disease as a result of the novel uh, coronavirus SARS-CoV-2, uh, as it's been, been uh, officially labeled. The size of that virus, that specific virus, happens to be about 0.12 micron in diameter. Um, viruses can be uh, downwards to um, uh, four, you know, about 10 nanometers or 0.01 uh, micron up to uh, 0.12 micron is actually a, a pretty, pretty large uh, virus as viruses go. Uh, bacterias are typically about two times that size, uh, just to give you a, a, an idea of what we're talking about. Um, how it's transmitted, um, obviously um, sneezing, coughing, um, what we call bioaerosols via respiratory droplets. Um, but we'll, we, I've got a slide a little bit later that it's, it's not just sneezing and coughing, it's uh, actually just normal day-to-day um, -day, uh, uh, breathing and such uh, as well. <clears throat> some science has come out to, to suggest that. And what are some of the precautions? Obviously, the uh, wear, wearing a, a barrier such as masks, social distancing, uh, you know, your, your good hygiene uh, practices, uh, tried and true um, methods uh, that we've learned throughout our, our, our lives. So um, there has been some new research that find, has found that the uh, virus uh, may be airborne uh, and transmissible, transmissible for up to three hours. A lot of, a lot of factors influence that. Um, I am not a biologist, uh, but uh, the New England Journal of Medicine has published this information. Um, even though there's uh, limited evidence, uh, the anecdotal uh, results suggest that um, the airborne, uh, the pathogen is airborne, and then there, ergo, isolation pr precautions are appropriate. Uh, whether it's in the uh, healthcare industry uh, under certain medical um, uh, activities or uh, in the workplace, uh, out in public, et cetera, et cetera. And those precautions include you know, PPE, um, increasing your filtration effectiveness, um, and then and the more critical applications or where you're trying, where you have an active patient. Uh, what they call negative pressure containment rooms. And then we've got a little bubble over there on the right-hand side that shows um, some of the surface um, survivability findings as well. So the question is, well, all right, now that I know it's a particulate that's, in the, that's airborne, what filter efficiency is necessary to be effective? So what do we have on the right-hand side? Uh, there's a little, little chart there based on particle size. Uh, keep in mind it is a uh, logarithmic logarithmic along the x-axis, but your viruses are, again, are, are pretty small, uh, down in the uh, nanometers up to, um, you know, 0.5 uh, micron. Um, but the virus isn't really, the, vi the size of the virus is, is of interest, but really the virus needs a carrier particle, whether it's um, phlegm, um, you know, respiratory uh, um, moisture, um, a skin particle. It, it needs something to, for it to, to piggyback on, essentially, to allow it to be transmitted and carried on. Um, and as you can see, uh, those, those particles tend to be somewhere between 0.5 micron and, and 5 microns, what we're calling bioaerosols. That said, the smaller the bioaerosol, or the smaller the particulate for that matter, the longer it will stay airborne. Now, whether it stays effective as a, as a biological um, agent, uh, that's another story. You know, that depends on UV exposure, as we learned uh, in, in the prior presentation. Uh, as well as a whole host of other other characteristics, but um, essentially the, the particles that we're interested in are going to be from the 0.5 micron up to the 5 micron um, size range. So here here's a system. Um, you know, as an engineer, we always think of worst case scenario. Uh, we've got a a, a small um, facility here, 60,000 cubic feet, um, operating about 7,000 cfm. Um, this assumes that. You know, there are no losses, there's no settling, there aren't any filters or coil in the air handler unit. But the reality is, you know, if you do the math uh, with a virus that lives for about three hours, um, you could actually circulate uh, that pathogen 21 times uh, through the system, uh, which would propagate it throughout uh, uh, this facility. So that's why the air filtration becomes such, such a, big, um, a, a big aspect for consideration. So ASHRAE's position paper, um, as we heard in the prior presentation, um, we, we do have a document that actually has been published routinely by, by ASHRAE and they were up for a renewal earlier this year. Uh, so they, you know, with the onset of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, 
COVID-19. Um, they, they actually wrote pieces specific to that, uh, to, the, to the bio aerosol uh, of, of interest. And basically, uh, I've highlighted some of the more um, pertinent um, aspects in sta uh, of their statements and their, their uh, recommendations uh, with respect to filtration and the HVAC systems. Uh, obviously, airborne exposure to the virus should be controlled. So what does that mean? Well, we, got, we can change our set points and our the way that our buildings operate. Uh, more fresh air intake, if possible. Um, obviously, uh, increase our filtration and, and ventilation efficiencies um, to reduce the transmission through the air. Again, increasing the filtration performance of the filters that are in place, or or, or going to the most uh, the highest filtration solution possible, uh, if 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 possible, obviously is desirable. Um, all with the uh, the mindset of risk mitigation. Um, and then there's the UVGI devices, which um, as, as uh, Dean was mentioning earlier, the, the three different types of applications historically have been more upper room and uh, uh, coil uh, disinfecting um, applications. And now they're going to, you know, kill on the fly, which is, uh, you know, the airstream uh, disinfection. And that's where, you know, positioning those those devices in their okay. system and then, may have an impact on certain uh, in, on certain components within the uh, what, 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 what name are you under it should be d donovan daniel donovan so ashray recommendations for healthcare buildings capture the exploratory aerosols uh, with the head wall exhaust i'll show an application of that with the airborne isolation infection room um, negative pressure isolation uh, setup uh, local air HEPA, HEPA grade filtration if possible, uh, maintain the negative pressure intensive care units. Again, use, use of the UVGI uh, upper room uh, and as well as um, kill on the fly. Uh, and again, increase the air, outdoor air exchange rate, more, more fresh air intake. So the recommended filtration solutions, uh, for those of you who are familiar with um, ASHRAE 522, this is the latest and greatest schedule for um, MERV ratings or minimum efficiency reporting value as, as um, um, defined by uh, ASHRAE. And as you can see, as you move from MERV 1 to MERV 16, the filtration requirements uh, become more stringent. Um, and typically what you see in most air handlers for pre-filters, you're gonna see a MERV 8, which in that size range of interest in those low particle sizes, there really isn't a whole lot of, uh, you know, there, there isn't, it isn't required of that filter uh, to meet any real stringent um, filtration requirements. Obviously, you're going to have a little bit of filtration um, at a MERV-8, even in the small range, but it's, it's going to be pretty, uh, pretty insignificant in the grand scheme of things. When you get up to MERV-13, where the minimum um, recommended level of filtration uh, is at the moment for MASHRAE, you're looking at 50% uh, um, efficiency at that small particle range of interest, 0.3 to 1 micron. Obviously, as you step up into MERV 14, 15, and 16, those efficiencies increase as well. So from a purely mathematical perspective, assuming that the virus is carried just on that small particle range, range of interest, and, and uh, stepping backwards, you'll notice that that MERV schedule, you've got three different ranges of particle sizes, 0.3 to 1 micron, 1 micron to 3 micron, and then 3 micron to 10 micron. The, the viruses and, and, and airborne pathogens um, that are going to stay airborne and circulate are going to be in your smaller ranges. Um, yes, uh, up to five micron um, can be a carrier, uh, as we call bioaerosol, but as I'll show later on, um, those particles tend to, to settle out quickly. It's the smaller particles of interest. So in this calculation here, we're, we're, taking, we're assuming all the viral load is in that 0.3 to 1 micron size range. And we're looking at what the minimum filtration of, uh, effect efficiencies are allowed to be by the MERV schedule. And this blue line is representative of a MERV 8 filter. So assuming no losses within the system, again, worst case scenario, um, that MERV 8 filter, you're going to have to cycle, go, go through that MERV filter, that, that MERV 8 filter 10 times to reduce from 100% load to just below 60% load. Now, if I go to the MERV 13 that's being recommended as the minimum right now, that's this red line. You'll see after about four or five um, passes through that filter, we're, we're reaching almost uh, no, no viral load uh, whatsoever. 
And again, these are mathematical. It assumes that the filtration efficiency stays the same, um, et cetera, et cetera. But there are other solutions, as you can see, with uh, a MERV 11 pre-pleat and a MERV 16 box within one pass, definitely within two passes, uh, it drops you down pretty dramatically. So this is just a, a way to mathematically look at the, the difference in um, effectiveness at that size range of interest with the different MERV ratings. Now, uh, calling out some of the assumptions over here, again, uh, one thing you need to be considered of is in more critical applications, charged synthetic uh, filters may have a reduction in their MERV rating. So something that's rated as a MERV 13, if it's a, if, if it's a purely synthetic uh, media, which ha has a uh, induced charge, that charge can be um, rendered ineffective uh, during normal operation and actually reduce its MERV rating from a MERV 13 to maybe a MERV 11 or MERV 10 or even, even lower. So uh, in your most critical applications, such as hospitals, pure mechanical filtration is, is what is recommended. And in that case, typically your mechanical filtration will increase over time as the filter loads, it becomes more efficient. However, the pressure drop also uh, will rise as well. Um, again, the assumptions here was that the viral load would con continue to recirculate um, continuously and no fallout, no other losses. But the big, big takeaway here is the big difference between that blue line and the red line, which is typically where you're operating with the MERV 8 on the blue and then where the minimum recommendation for a MERV 13 is on the red. Your quickest mitigation strategies, I mean, we've, we've been wearing these um, masks for a while. So that guy on the right hand side, I think we all understand that there's a little bit of bypass going on there. Uh, and we, in our day-to-day uh, -day lives, in our air handler units, uh, what we see on the left hand side is the uh, settling of uh, dust, debris, some gunk on, on a coil. That's typically as a result of um, uh, improper upstream filtration or you have some bypass. Essentially, if you're bypassing the filter, uh, you're not filtering the air. So to filter all the air, the air must pass through the filter. Uh, a one millimeter gap around uh, a MERV 15 filter uh, can reduce its efficiency, the system efficiency to a MERV 14. And again, there is no MERV-14 system efficiency, but it would be equivalent to a MERV-14 filter. Uh, a 10 mil millimeter gap or less than half an inch uh, can drop a, a filters or the system's MERV rating by two levels. These are, this was a study that was done by ASHRAE uh, about 15 years ago. Um, it's tried and true. Uh, but one thing to consider though, as you increase the, the filtration efficiency, Typically, you're going to increase the system pressure drop as well, which means you're going to have jetting and more by, more proficient, proficiency of bypass. So as the as you have have more system pressure or resistance across a filter, uh, that air is going to take the path of least resistance, and if there's any gap, it's going to expose it. So what do we what can we do to mitigate that? Obviously, just your typical um, routine uh, maintenance and upkeep: uh, caulk all your seams, tape all your seams. Uh, make sure you've got adequate gasketing material. Make sure all, you got all your spring clips on your filters. Um, I know the air handler unit tends to be the last thing on anyone's um, uh, checkbox list of things to, to, to go check out and inspect and, and, and uh, you know, keep, keep, uh, keep up. But it's, it's one that, um, you know, these, these little things will make a, make a, can make a very profound difference. That said, if I take this uh, MERV schedule that we looked at earlier, turn it up on its, on its side, and we're looking at the MERV 8 up through MERV 16 and the different, um, the, the different size ranges of interest. Yes, a MERV 16 is obviously going to be uh, your best option when you're choosing these filters. And you may be able to include MERV 16 uh, filters in your existing racks and housings. Just keep in mind that they're typically, a, a, you know, a, a deeper filter, so you need you need uh, wider tracks. Um, but a MERV 16 filter is going to remove that 0.5 to 5 micron, almost um, you know at least 95 percent or greater, greater than 95 percent. But the concept here is even if you if you're using a MERV 8 and you can't jump to a MERV 16, any incremental movement up the MERV uh, rating is going to have a, an impact on mitigating risk with respect to bioaerosols. So even though a MERV, MERV uh, 8 is only 20% uh, efficient minimum uh, in the one to three micron range, if you can get up to a MERV 10, you've already doubled that, right? More than doubled that. So it, it does have an effect. It is worth considering. So just, you know, obviously you want to attain the best you can, but 
there are there are considerations to be made. And some of those considerations, obviously pressure drop. Typically the more efficient filter you, you incorporate, the higher the resistance. Again, MERV 16 filters are typically six to 12 inches deep. So you're gonna have to have uh, typically a, a upgrade your, your uh, filter rack. Uh, one other consideration is to make sure that you've got enough room in your, in your, um, in your air handler for, for access, um, installing and, and replacing filters, uh, not just inside the air handler, but also the doors uh, access into the air handlers as well. Um, one option is standalone filter housings. Uh, they come in all kinds of configurations. Um, they can be put in your, in your system um, uh, at, you know, uh, wherever they can fit. Uh, but there, there, are, there are ways to daisy chain these things together to stage them. Uh, so you can either do them as, as discrete um, banks or you can actually uh, make multi-stage banks too, depending on what your uh, requirements and access um, options may be. Best mitigation strategy is gonna be a HEPA filtration system, but um, most that, that's, that's a huge step from, from a general HVAC um, application. But what I wanted to show here is the, the, the droplets. So uh, what we have here in the bottom right uh, is someone um, uh, sneezing. You've got very large droplets being expelled and you can see those basically falling to the ground within five meters, six meters. There are mores that are airborne, that tend to stay airborne. But it's this little cloud here, um, the, the, the smoke cloud that you see that is really of interest because once those dissipate, you can't see those. Um, here we have someone coughing, uh, not quite as uh, a big event as sneezing but the same phenomenon, the same effect. And here at the top left, we have basically just normal breathing, exhaling. You still have large droplets. And this is where that social distancing mandate comes in, two meters or six feet, because those large droplets are gonna fall pretty quickly. But it's this very small droplets, the very small bioaerosols that are actually gonna stay airborne and, and just float around. And just so you realize what we're talking about over here, here's settling velocity of particles. Again, this is in a, Controlled room, no thermal um, air gradients, no no forced air ventilation. It's just a stagnant room. If I were to, uh, if I had a particle size of 0.1 micron, uh, basically it's going to have a settling velocity of uh, 0.00016 feet per minute. It's it would take 40 days for it to, to settle 10 feet. A diameter of one micron. It's going to fall a little bit faster, but it, it would literally stay airborne for days. Now, again, when it comes to viruses and, and, and biologicals, that doesn't mean they stay viable that long. It just means the particulate would actually stay airborne for that long. And uh, with air currents and uh, other things going on, obviously, um, th these are worst case scenarios. But that, that's why um, the, the, the six foot or two meter um, social distancing has put in place for the large droplets. But we also need to be considered of these smaller particles. And that's where the air filtration comes into, into play. This slide has quite a lot of information on it, but what we did here is we took actual data from MERV 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 filters, as well as a HEPA filter, and we dovetailed in the ASHRAE 522 testing results with an EN 1822, which is a HEPA filter geared testing, which does fractional efficiency uh, at these lower particle sizes. Uh, the blue range is the carrier particulate rate, uh, size of interest. The beige is the actual uh, virus size itself. And what you can see is in this, again, this is the low end of the MERV range right here, the, the, that E1.3 to one micron range for a MERV 13 filter, which is this green line right here. It has to have a minimum overall efficiency of 50%, 50 which it does obviously, but you can see that once I move up in the MERV, MERV ratings, and then once I get to a HEPA, I get almost absolute filtration across the entire particle range. And that's, that's the one thing about HEPA filters, and that's why they're used in critical applications um, and, and biocontainment and such. So that's why a HEPA filter is the ideal um, risk mitigation policy, uh, but it does come with trade-offs, uh, obviously. So I, there's no way I'm gonna be able to put a HEPA filter in my existing HEPA rack or uh, air handler without uh, serious modifications. Um, these filters are, you know, 12 inches deep, typically to, to try and reduce that pressure drop as much as possible. But even then, your typical uh, resistance is at normal operating uh, velocities is going to be about 
and over an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half um, clean um, pressure drop. So as it loads, obviously that pressure drop is going to increase. So it's substantially larger pressure drop. So you need to make sure you have the right uh, air moving equipment to accommodate that. Uh, and then just on the size thing, um, most HEPA filters are supplied uh, with actual dimensions. So if you say a 24 by 24 HEPA, you're going to get a 24 inch by 24 inch box. Uh, and most general HVAC applications, a 24 by 24 is a nominal size, uh, but you would have to specify a 23 and 3 8 by 23 and 3 8 HEPA to make sure it fits in the hole. Again, it's like the, um, the uh, MERV filters, there are multiple housing uh, and, and uh, frame solutions. Uh, we can put frames in an existing air handler if there's room. Um, but you could also consider standalone um, HEPA housings as well. And again, those can be configured uh, based on your system requirements. From a filtration solution perspective, you've got a MERV 13 free filter, which is the minimum recommended, and it's gonna give you your lowest initial resistance. Um, but the caution here is that typically those MERV 13 filters are, are usually 100% synthetic, high loft. When it's 100% synthetic, typically that means it's a charged media it may lose charge over time, reducing its filtration uh, effectiveness. And as was mentioned earlier, because it's a synthetic, it's usually going to be susceptible to uh, UV light exposure. So keep that in mind. Uh, secondary filter, what we would recommend is the V-Bank Mini Pleat. These are available on your higher MERV ratings. Some of them are even offered with an um, antimicrobial um, component as well. Uh, but obviously, the higher the MERV rating, you're going to that's the more reduction of the respirable particulate you're gonna have. So not just viral, but also the air quality in general. Um, these particular types of filters, uh, because of their configuration, the, the mini pleat uh, V arrangement, you get a lot more media than you would a, uh, mm -hmm. a, a box filter. Uh, and ergo, um, you know, can help you with your system resistance issues as well. And then <clears throat> uh, the, the best solution to have a filter uh, can be offered okay. in in a glass um, media, or there are new technologies, uh, membrane technologies out there. Uh, but again, this is going to be a minimum of 99.97% efficiency across all but particles. How can you do that? So 99.97 is worst case. Uh, but there are, uh, when it comes to resistance, there are membrane technologies available as well that will give you half the resistance of the traditional glass. So again, at your normal air handling velocities, about three quarters of an inch water gauge. Um, so that may there may be solutions out there to with your existing um, configurations that you may be actually be able to move into the HEPA realm uh, with, with little or no um, modifications other than racks or, or frames. Um, plenty of options there. Um, specialty application, here's a, you know, a cross-sectional view of a hospital. Obviously you have air handlers um, feeding air into the system. Um, you can have uh, air purifiers that are wall mounted or ceiling mounted. You can have it modular air, uh, air purifiers. Um, obviously you've got your, um, your upper room, UVGI throughout the facility. Uh, there, there are legitimately, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of applications within, a, within this type of uh, healthcare environment. The one uh, couple that are of most concern, we're gonna look at the most critical applications, uh, require the specialty equipment or the airborne infection isolation rooms and then also these negative pressure uh, containment housings um, to make sure uh, any biologicals that are being exhausted aren't just being put back out into the, uh, the environment. Uh, that negative pressure bag in bag out system, that's a tried and true method for um, removing contaminated particulate, whether it be bioaerosols or you know, uh, hazardous waste, uh, nuclear contamination. Um, there are turnkey packages available uh, with blower mounted uh, units on skids. Uh, but basically the idea here is when we say bag in, bag out, you have access panels into your, your filters, whether it's pre-filter, HEPA filter, there's all kinds of different arrangements. This one has a pre-filter and a HEPA filter, but there's a, um, there's a bagging ring and a bag just underneath this, the, these doors, which creates a physical barrier between the environment and the person that's, that's um, servicing the unit and the inside of the unit. So anything that's inside the unit stays contained. Um, you replace the bag. There's a method to do that. To, to mini minimize any potential exposure and ergo keep anything that's within the, the uh, potentially contaminated system um, contained from being exposed to the environment or the person servicing the equipment. 
Um, most hospitals um, would, would use these, um, these types of arrangements um, uh, in their, uh, again, an airborne infection isolation room exhaust, uh, if they're doing any uh, radiological um, uh, medicine um, processing, that sort of thing. So here's a kind of way of a healthcare isolation room, um, also known as an airborne infection isolation room. Uh, typically you have your patient uh, sitting here on the bed with a low wall return exhaust, and then you have a dedicated exhaust out through a stack off the roof through one of these housings. These can be bag in, bag out or not. They're not uh, required to be bag in, bag out, but if you like your maintenance guys, probably uh, it's a pretty, pretty low insurance option. Um, but what we have here is basically the hallway, the ante room, and then the patient room, all supplied uh, well, the ante room and the patient room are supplied with HEPA air, but you have a negative pressure cascade, which forces when these doors are open, the air to move from the um, from the hallway into the ante room, from the ante room into the patient room, and that way it comes across the patient and will remove any contaminant out of that space uh, without exposing it to the healthcare prof or minimizing any potential exposure to the healthcare professionals and anyone else um, in the facility. And you'll have HEPA supplied air, like I said, into the ante room and into the patient room. And then you'll have this exhaust, um, it basically uh, push through HEPA filters as well, uh, which would uh, remove any of the contaminant from the air stream itself before it's exhausted out into the environment. Uh, also, um, some other filtration devices, fan filter units with HEPA filters. So what we see here is a cross section of that. Basically, it's a a fan uh, in, in a box pushing air through a HEPA filter um, into an occupied space. Uh, it can be a lo local space or it can be an entire room. Um, and then you also have recirculating units, uh, which is what we see here, uh, which would stand in a room and just recirc the air. Uh, those are typically used in um, like waiting rooms and, and office environments and that sort of thing, but they can be used anywhere. And then a wall mounted unit as well as possible for dedicated exhaust. So in summary, um, the COVID-19 um, disease is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's about 0.12 micron in diameter. The virus travels via bioaerosols up, up to five microns, but the smaller the particle size, obviously the, the longer it will stay airborne, um, short of being filtered out of the environment or being rendered um, uh, ineffective through, through the means of like UVGI. Uh, your quickest uh, mitigation strategy is to seal off your frames, housings, um, do your general uh, upkeep um, to mitigate bypass. Upgrade your filtration efficiency, um, existing filtration efficiency to the highest level you can. Uh, any upgrade uh, moving higher in efficiency is going to reduce the uh, risk of airborne contamination. Um, HEPA filters are the best mitigation strategy, but again, you have to be cognizant of the system resistance, um, the ability to overcome that resistance, and then having the physical space to put in special frames or housings to accommodate the HEPA filters. And then if you are incorporating UV lights, well, we kind of touched on this earlier, but um, if you can incorp incorporate them such that they're uh, not in the line of sight of, uh, or the, the fil filtration, the filters are not in line of sight of the, the UV light, uh, that's your best best uh, course of action. If that's not possible, then you need to use filters that um, do not use synthetic media uh, or or um, uh, synthetic you know synthetic plastic frames and such. You need to go with glass media uh, and metal frames. So with that, I thank you for your time, and I believe the next presenter, um, uh, Daniel Donovan, oh. now available. Yeah. Yep. I heard yeah. Danny. A lot of background noise, Fred. Okay, I will try and deal with that. Uh, if folks will put themselves, if folks will put themselves on mute, except for Pat and uh, Dan, that would be appreciated. Are you are you getting noise from me? Uh. Uh, we can't tell who the noise is from, uh, except that it's gone when you muted yourself, Pat.
Okay, uh, Pat, why don't you Yeah. Yeah, I told it to uh, quiet down. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Our next speaker is Danny Donovan, and Danny is the Director of Energy Management Sustainability uh, at DCAS. I've had the honor and pleasure of working with Danny many years, and I can tell you he's a hell of a guy. Um, mechanical maintenance and operations in, at, at DCAS and, uh, Facilities Management. His role is to improve energy efficiency across the portfolio of 55 buildings directly managed by DCAS Facilities Management. He's responsible for maintenance and operations of that portfolio. And since uh, COVID-19, he's been focused on responding to the new public health demands for uh, in the context of building operations. So without any further ado, Dan Donovan. Hello, everybody, and um, hope you can hear me all right. We I can uh, hear you. Very good. I apologize for um, the mix-up. Uh, Fred, thank you for reaching out. I read the email wrong. I thought it was 4.15, so I was uh, you know, <laughs> taking my time until I got the phone call. Why are you not on this thing? So anyway, here <laughs> I am. All sorted out. Thank you. Uh, Pat, um, I want to thank you and, and, uh, and Fred and Bob for inviting me to this forum. It's an um, incredible organization. You guys do a lot of work, great work. And uh, to be able to present here today is an honor. And I also just want to say that, um, you know, I, I've got a, a big shoes to fill or uh, I'm following a great presentation by Don. So um, I hope I can just be half as good or as, as informative of, as Don was with his. So, uh, you know, I'm just um, going to play this here and I'm not sure why. Oh, yeah, here we go. Sorry. So um, that's just my role at, with DCAS and exactly what I do. Um, I'm kind of assumed the role of Director of Maintenance, Mechanical and Operation, as well as the Energy Portfolio. So you can imagine it's been pretty busy. And a lot of our buildings, um, I'm sure some of you are in the same boat that we, we are, we were in when uh, March hit. A lot of our, some of our buildings were actually shut down completely. And before we could open up, there were certain things that we, we had to adhere to, like flushing domestic hot water systems, stuff that you don't really think of. And this, of course, is to mitigate any possibility of Legionella that was in our buildings. And um, of course, this would also be uh, in compliance with ASHRAE standards. I believe it's 188, 2018, I think. So yeah, your, your flushing systems um, for uh, hot water, and to try and uh, get rid of any Legionella. So what we would do is bring those systems up to um, 140 degrees to kill any Legionella and then maintain 130 to, uh, because that's where Legionella will not survive. Uh, we disinfected house tanks. Um, again, you circulate a, a, um, a solution, a chlorine solution, you drain, you flush, and that's of course to remove any biofilm or uh, sediment and bacterial growth that forms when, when places are shut down for several months. Um, you know, an obvious thing, but maybe not obvious to everybody, prime and floor drains, of course, um, eliminate sewer gas entry. And then as we get back into occupancy, people want uh, outside air. And uh, one of the problems we have is um, a lot of the the, uh, the, I'm gonna say the judges and everybody else in our buildings, they read the New York Times article on the murder rating of a filter and they become an expert. And they're gonna tell you how you need to run your building. And a lot of times, you know, we are, we're, we're not able to, to, to um, deliver exactly what the New York Times article is saying that we should be doing for obvious reasons. But one of the other things we've done also, of course, is um, I shouldn't say of course, we would change our pre-filters, the MERV-8 um, that Don spoke about, we would change them quarterly. We're now doing that monthly because that's, that's what they've asked us for. Cooling towers, uh, another one, we had a few buildings that were shut down and we needed to uh, move some staff around because we're very short. But keep in mind, you know, we have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that if you shut a building down with a cooling tower, you've got to start up again with a mechanical cleaning. 
So to, uh, to mitigate that, uh, we would have someone go there every day and just circulate the, the, uh, the water within the cooling tower. Then we would do our uh, monitor, you know, temperature, PhD, conductivity, uh, bio concentrations, and uh, microbial monitoring weekly. And um, that's to get our buildings back to where we kind of wanted them to be. So now we're, we're in the next phase of everything as a city agency, and that phase is reoccupancy. So there are, you know, huge, uh, there are meetings internally on a regular basis, and we're doing this to discuss ways that we can um, facilitate a, a safer um, building occupancy as we move forward. And one of the other questions we have, of course, is this line right here, has how we operate our facilities, has it changed forever? As they look for a vaccine for a virus, none of us are doctors. So what we try to do is, is we try to work with what we have and what we know. And this changes weekly um, about this virus or the facts uh, surrounding the virus. So um, questions that have come up internally at the very beginning. Uh, can we change MERV-8 filters to MERV-13 without an for, um, adverse effect? And all of these questions that are on this slide are typical of, of a lot of the questions that came up over time. And uh, the answer, of course, to these is no, right? No to one, no to two. So what would it take to help us operate our HVAC systems as normal as possible while increasing occupancy levels? So as, as Don pointed out, you're looking at HEPA filters, UVG lighting on every AHU. And, you know, whereas there's difference between possibility and probability. And, and that's what we need to understand. And that's what we need the people who are coming in as the tenants or as the occupants to understand also. So technologies, new and old, that can help make our buildings safe. And that's right now where we're at. And we're starting to, to open up our courthouses and we're starting to bring people back. And there's a few technologies that we've worked, um, done a lot of research on behind the scenes. And I, I'm delighted to be able to bring one of them to the forefront here today or to have the opportunity to do it because it's something we're excited about. Uh, the, the main ones here that we're gonna talk about, of course, um, that we're looking at are UVG lighting. You have uh, bipolar ionization. We have air infection rate calculator developed by DEM. And that was developed by Alex who um, came in recently. It's an incredible tool. It's, it's an Excel tool that you calculate. Um, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more in the next slide. And then there's uh, current biotech NVRT A1. It's a technology out of the University of Houston that the second part of my presentation is pretty much gonna be on. So UVG lighting has a cost and a time factor involved. And when you work for the city and the city is broke, um, installing uh, UV lighting in a thousand air handlers in your portfolio, then I think you understand where I'm going with that. Uh, bipolar ionization is an interesting technology that we definitely have looked at and uh, it's used a lot in Florida or in dusty climates and um, easier to install but in the larger air handlers, it can be quite costly. And the, the cost factor on that is about 50 cents per CFM on the larger units. The air, uh, the air infection rate calculator. So this is a calculator that if you, if you can, you get your air changes from your space, you measure the, uh, the cubic feet of the space, and that'll tell you safely how many occupants you can have in that area. And it's, it's pretty accurate, uh, devised over uh, several months of um, research by Alex with the University of Adelaide in Australia, and also uh, in touch with the universities in Rome, um, or in Italy, I believe Milan as well. So he put a lot of work into this, and I believe it's gonna be um, subject of a, of a, a National Geographic documentary at some point. So this is a very interesting tool and kudos to Alex for, for the work he's done. And, and I actually did not get his permission to talk about this, but um, 
I was lucky and honored that he included me early on before they rolled this out to test it in some of our buildings uh, with him. And I found it just absolutely fascinating. And the last one that I'm gonna talk about is uh, current biotech. Um, MVTR is, is their, I guess, their name for tracking it. Um, it's out of the University of Houston. And the reaction I'm, I'm going to give you right now is um, it forms a hydrophobic barrier, OK? You spray it on a filter, and it makes it waterproof and doesn't affect the airflow. So your reaction, I think there's 120 or 118 people on this call. Your reaction to that statement is the exact same as mine when I heard it first. Uh, and, and that's why I'm kind of smiling. So, um, you know, we, we look at the, what we're concentrating on is combining some of these technologies because uh, in fairness, I think we all know that one technology alone isn't going to help us to get back to where we need to get to. And we need to get back to occupying our buildings for two reasons. One, we need to get people back to work because we need to get the economy moving again. Uh, New York City is um, it's, it's in bad shape. And if we can find ways to get people back safely, even though the winter is coming and they're, they're waiting or predicting the worst, um, I, I think that that's, we owe that to New York City and I think we owe, we owe it to everybody. So this is like why we're working hard behind the scenes on looking at old, tried and tested, and looking at anything new that, that we can. And this is one of those new products that we're excited about. So, you know, what, what gives um, this new technology from the University of Houston, what gives it credibility? Well, the first thing that, that we're gonna take a look at is um, developed by uh, Professor Seamus Curran. He was named in December to the National Academy of Inventors in recognition for his work in nanotechnology. He holds 19 issued and penned in US patents, and he holds 40 international patents. So first of all, you know, when I was introduced to this and I spoke to, uh, to Professor Curran, I will call him Shea from now on because um, I've spoke to him so much, that this is what grabbed me first, number one. Number two was that this is a university technology. This is, this is not a private corporation. So that's kind of why I continued and got my team to continue to be interested in this. So how does it work? Well, it forms a hydrophobic barrier, like I said, and uh, which stops the virus at the filter. So if you look at the one on the left, that's a very cheap uh, filter. You can see the weave pattern here, and this is water that's dyed. So this is a photograph that they proved that provided to us, but the one on the right, after I got a sample from them, we actually uh, applied it to filters and we tested it ourselves and it does do exactly what they said it does. It forms a, 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 a water barrier, a water seal, and the water just beaded and fell right off it. So that was, uh, that was uh, pretty, pretty fascinating. And um, so what we needed to see, so to, to get to the next level, I think with, with any technology, what you're looking to do is you gotta show us some sort of independent lab results claiming what you claim, right? And of course, my, my biggest fear was how can you waterproof any material and tell me that you're not stopping any airflow through it. And I just can't see how that's possible or I can't get my head around it. So those, these are the things I need to see before I'm willing to even go to the next step. And here is the independent lab result. And it took me uh, quite a while to, to try and understand what relative fluorescence were and what cycles were and the tension thres threshold was but here you have a MERV-8 treated filter on the bottom. Here you have a MERV-8 treated filter, or an untreated filter 
and here with the virus. And this is tested with COVID-19, with COVID-19 virus, not anything else. And here is the MERV-13 untreated. So they also uh, tested this against a MERV-14 filter. And uh, the 14 performed much better, apparently, than the 13. But it still, of course, had leakage. And uh, that slide I do not have because that data was not available when I was putting this slide together. But you know, some of the, the, uh, the cycles of concentration and, and basically how it was um, explained to me was as they take the sample that the virus was sprayed on and they put that through the machine and through the process, each run is a cycle and each cycle cracks open part of the, of the shell of the virus to um, basically release what's called the RNA. So we know that uh, RNA is a single strand of, the, of DNA, which is uh, human. So once they, the more RNA that is exposed to the fluorescent and uh, the, the more light is shine upon it and, and it'll start to shoot up. So at about 30 cycles, the MERV-8, the, the presence of the virus that got through the MERV-8 shot up. And about 35, the MERV-13 shot up. As you can see all the way over here, we still had zero penetration on the MERV-8 treated filter with this hydrophobic solution. So what's important up here is uh, when I read that data, I said, so you're telling me it performs in, on par with a HEPA filter because a HEPA filter cannot do better than that. And they said, no, we will not make that claim. They will only, because they're a university and they cannot become subjective, they will only claim what they tested against. Right now, they are willing to say that it outperforms a MERV-14 filter. Um, a, a treated MERV-8 will outperform a MERV-14 filter because that's what they've tested against. They are looking to go back into the lab but I'm sure everybody is aware that everyone has all these labs booked up testing for COVID-19. So when you book a lab, it takes quite a while to actually get in there with a product and have it tested. So they're back on the waiting list to test against MERV-16 and HEPA filter. They are expecting that the HEPA filter will perform, um, uh, that there will be zero leakage on the HEPA filter because they've, uh, of their research that they've done on that HEPA filter. And um, so how can you stop the virus that's less than three microns, but allow other particles to go through? And, you know, the university, when, when I spoke to them, uh, they, didn't, they didn't look at stopping the virus. What they decided to do was they wanted to look at what does the virus travel in? It travels in water. So if they stop the water, they can stop the virus. So let's stop the vehicle is basically how they said it to me. And they needed to understand how the filters worked. So I, I, they didn't know Don. If they knew Don, I would have introduced Don to them and he could have explained exactly. So they had to do their research and uh, through NASA, which makes for some very interesting light reading before bed, right? So, uh, Filters and their important role. You've already had this from Don on his one, so I'm not going to go through this one uh, with you because everybody knows what the filters do from MERV 1 all the way up to a MERV 16. But the interesting part here was uh, HEPA filters and, and the N95. So the, the key here is what's called brown in motion. So the brown in motion is. Um, it's where particles less than three um, microns that they actually, when they, when they um, hit gas or when they come in contact with a gas, they actually ping pong, they, they zigzag through the openings of a filter. And one of the things that, that I always made the mistake of, when I thought of a filter, I thought of a filter like a net. Anything bigger than the net is going to get caught. Anything smaller than the net, or anything bigger than the net, yeah, we'll get caught. Anything smaller, we'll go through. But it's not. You can't think of a filter as a net because the weave, it goes across in several patterns. 
forcing these particles to change direction as they go through. And that's how the HEPA filter and the N95 are so effective, but yet you can still breathe through them. If, if, you, if you put any more weaves on, sure, you're gonna stop everything, but you're not gonna get any air through. You have to have air as well. So that's the key. And, and once they understood how the, the filter was actually manufactured and put together, they were now able to use their nanotechnology to adhere to the single fibers, every single fiber within the tread of a filter. This solution actually adheres to and wraps around. So it doesn't form a coat, it's on every individual fiber. That stops the water, but doesn't stop the air. And that's when it clicked to me how this is working. Next thing we had to do was, um, uh, those of you who know me, uh, I, I have to see for myself. I'm a, bit, a little bit like the doubt in Thomas. So I wanted, um, I asked them for, send me some solution and we'll check the static pressure ourselves to make sure that there is no or little static pressure change. And when they did, I, I resulted um, absolutely zero between a treated or an untreated MERV-8 filter. Now, I did not try these on any other filter. I just tried them on the MERV-8. And the one that I done, the main one that I done was a 40,000 CFM air filter with 25, 24 by 24 by two MERV-8s. And we actually recorded that from beginning to end. And uh, in, in the interest of boredom, we sped up the filter change, the guys doing the filter change. And uh, Don will be, very delight will be very happy if he ever sees the video. We put the clips back in every single one of them. And uh, that one is on video. I didn't have a, a photo or a photo of that. This one I actually done separate. This is a smaller unit, 8,000 CFM, and it only has eight uh, filters. But this one, here on the left was the MERV-8 filters after a month. They were due their, their um, monthly change the day that we actually changed out with the treated MERV-8 filter. And the, this was the filter after a month, exactly 0.2. And when we put in the treated filter, it was 0.193. And, you know, this really is not apples to apples because this is a we don't know, you know, maybe this was less when it was new, so there was an increase. So, but that was to give me an idea of what was happening. But when we actually done the main air handler, there was zero increase in static across it with the treated filter. So what are the risk factors? Uh, that's the, you know, that's the next step for us as a, uh, as a municipality or as a, um, an agency and the risk factor is changing the filters. So we want to make sure that engineering personnel um, do not become exposed to a live virus. So test results from that independent lab, they show that 94% of the virus is dead after 60 minutes and the remaining 6% uh, approximately another 30 minutes. So, you know, our, our, um, our protocol now is you're going to leave the unit off for at least two hours. So what we'll do is leave the unit off overnight and then come back in the next day and then you do your filter change. But still, you wear all your PPE. You never do anything without proper PPE, especially in this COVID world that we're living in. And um, so, you know, we're, we're, again, we're trying to make our buildings safer for all occupants, uh, try to keep our facilities operational during winter season by minimizing the amount of outside air so we can maintain set points and avoid freeze ups. We want to get people back to work so we can get our economy moving. And the other thing is that, you know, I understand that safety is paramount. We get that 100%. But we've made incredible gains in the world of greenhouse gas reduction over the last six years in DCAS FM. And I do not want to give these gains back overnight. I'm, I want to fight to keep the greenhouse gas reduction and the energy reduction uh, as low as we can, even though we're entering into a unprecedented time throughout in, in operation. So that's what kind of 
forced us into looking at new technologies. And I think this is uh, one that's incredibly exciting. I do know that there's, um, there, there's a lot of, of um, talk about it down in Houston right now. And I know it's the, the topic of a, of a news outlet down there. And it's my understanding that ABC News here um, actually have heard about it. So they're now looking into uh, doing something on this quite soon. So we're, we're trying, you know, we're, we, it's a new technology. We're trying to use it. Uh, we have it already in some of our buildings and then I know DEM are signing a contract with them for the new ideas program. So once that's in place, uh, I, I think it's something that, you know, everybody's going to be talking about because once I got my head around what it was, we started calling it the game changer. And I think that's what this is without under, un, uh, any understatement whatsoever. So uh, on that note, um, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, sometimes I kind of rush through things. I do apologize if I went too fast, but um, hopefully uh, somebody got something out of it. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. That was uh, fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you, all three speakers. They're three excellent um, presentations here. Um, we're kind of tight on time, so uh, we ask that you, any questions that you have, please put them into the chat. And uh, after the end of this seminar, what we'll do is we'll uh, get those together and we'll respond to them and then have them have the answers listed on our website. So again, I uh, would like to thank you all for coming today. It was a uh, 110 people had participated, so it's a great participation. Um, and we look forward to uh, our October meeting. Uh, Devetti, do you want to come on and maybe talk a little bit about that and so forth? Or uh, um, I, <coughs> excuse what, me, I do want to come on and just remind, well, to tell everyone that if you would like PDH hours or CEUs that I have just put out a link to a SurveyMonkey three question survey that we will need you to complete in order to get you your CEUs. Uh, we will also collect your name and email address there. Don't expect them tomorrow because it's a manual function of um, downloading that information. But if you want CEUs, please do that. Again, these questions will be answered by our speakers and probably I'll send an email out to everybody with those answers. So thank you very much for being here today. We look forward to seeing you for our program in October. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Fred, please leave this open for a little bit so that people can scroll back and uh, get that link and also yeah. so that people can submit their questions. Yeah, I, I'm going to do that. And for our board members, uh, I, I'm going to wait another couple of minutes to, uh, to do what Devetta just said. And actually, let me stop recording. Uh,